So shall we start by introducing ourselves? So um, I'll just say that I'm Deborah. I started the Solo in Style group um, and I've been traveling solo since I was about 50. So that's coming up for 14 years, which is a de depressing fact. Um, <laughs> not the traveling solo, but just the age. And um, I, fell into, <laughs> I fell into solo travel just by accident, really, due to a divorce, an unexpected divorce. And um, and enjoyed it so much and felt very empowered by it that I just carried on doing it. And so um, I wanted to kind of start a community where other ladies could share experiences and um, and we could all help each other if, if you know, if we were looking for any kind of guidance or tips or, um, you know, um, encouragement along the way. So, um, so that's kind of my background. I'm in London. Lisa, do you want to introduce yourself? You are much more of a a solo expert than I am. I know you've been traveling solo a longer than me. Not that much longer, only about 22 years. So that's, and you were 15, not that much longer. But yeah, I'm 47. I started solo traveling when I was 25. So I've been traveling over the last two decades before mobile phones were even a thing when you had to travel with a guidebook and have paper maps um, when it was a lot more challenging. And I started my blog when I went through a divorce. So I've been blogging for 10 years and I wanted to show people that A, there was life after divorce and B, at the time, there didn't seem to be those that many resources for solo female travellers, especially in regards to what you were saying, Deborah, with help and advice. So right. I wanted to include if anything goes wrong or include a forum for people who wanted to connect and talk about solo female travel so I travel to emerging destinations and it's my aim to try and see every single country in the world in my lifetime if possible and I'm from the UK and I'm now based in Dubai so I was nomadic for quite a while and just traveling and living out of a bag and now I'm got a base in Dubai which is amazing yeah I know you're really loving it there aren't you it's I have been a couple of times it's a it's a I think it's a great place but I've only ever tended to really go there sort of on the way to somewhere else rather than as a destination but I know it's um it has a lot to offer I think it divides people I think you either really like it or you really don't like it and it's been really interesting trying, not trying to change people's perceptions of it, but showing people the side of it that I see. And so more women from my community seem quite interested in it. So I think that's the beauty as well of solo travel is going to a destination <laughs> and inspiring other people to go there. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of places. I mean, I know you tend to travel pretty much exclusively. So on your own. Um, I do most of my travel on my own, but I will join groups um, if there are places that I want to see where I feel perhaps less comfortable. And I don't, uh, I, I'm just trying to think, or if it's or if it's to do a particular activity that, um, that, to, you, that you would do in a group, for example, I like to scuba dive. So I would go on in, in a group for diving. Um, but I mean, um, do you have you know, have you ever done any groups at all or are you you're pretty much exclusively on your own so some of the countries that you might want to go to for example may not be that safe you know the, for us for anyone traveling alone let alone a solo female yeah I do tend to be independent and go by myself I think depending on which areas you go to it's more it's easier so Europe for example I've got no problem going by myself and I didn't really do any tours in Europe but in um, South America, when I went there the first time, because I didn't speak any Spanish, I thought it would be better to take a tour. So I've done the occasional longer group tours. So I've tested a few different companies. And then normally I would just do a day tour, for example, and meet people yeah. on a day yeah. tour. You could combine it. That's a really good way of doing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, for me, if I'm going somewhere where I feel quite nervous about going, so for example, I was meant to go to Pakistan two weeks ago. Uh, it didn't quite happen, but I felt very nervous about going there by myself. And I joined a tour for that because I wanted to have a local guide. I wanted somebody who knew all the cultural norms, what I should do, what I shouldn't do before I go. Yeah. And also it's a country that 
I don't know that much about and what I have read about it would kind of put people off from going so I right. think if you're unsure joining a group tour is just a great way of finding your feet in a destination you can always go back to that destination if you're if you're solo and you can walk comfortable at a later date yeah and you're right and and um and also if you do travel in groups sometimes you can end up meeting a sort of a travel buddy that you kind of then have such some things in common with that you kind of keep in touch with for a long time afterwards as travel is you know obviously a common and once you've traveled with somebody I think it's really important to know how people travel before you decide to travel with them when people are looking for buddies and things it's not something I would do with just you know, put out a, a request for a buddy because I'm quite particular the one thing about me I don't know here's a good question I, maybe I should answer my question first what what is what do I think is so great about solo travel I love the fact that you can just please yourself you can go mm -hmm. where you want I am such a pleaser I spend my life avoiding confrontation if I'm in any any group situation I always bow to the group I, and then I'll go on group in group trips sometimes and I'll come back and think I haven't done anything that I wanted to do because I spent my whole time doing what everybody else wants so I love all of that um being able to really kind of design and 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 and, and travel how you want to where you want to and, and, and be quite selfish about it I mean, that's what appeals to me about solo travel. I don't know about you, Lisa. I love the freedom that I get, especially because with my blog and I've been online for 10 years, I feel like I'm, I always need to be online and I always need to be there for people. And I am a bit of a people pleaser as well, even though I'm working on that. But solo travel for me just gives me that time away by myself where I'm pleasing myself. I don't have to do anything for anybody else. I don't have to compromise in regards to dinner time or yeah. where you want to eat or what you want to do. It just gives me that freedom in it. I, I need that every now and again. I need at least three days off by myself, the reflection time and also for just building that confidence back again, just to remind myself that, that I can do it and that I'm strong enough. But yeah, I find it quite overwhelming if I'm with people too much and I need to kind of retreat and I think solo travel is perfect if you're introverted it's good for yeah. extroverts as well for, for a certain amount of time but for introverts it's it's brilliant yeah I mean a lot of a lot of ladies come in the group and, and worry about being introvert and, and being unable to kind of enjoy solo travel because they're they may be afraid that they would literally not speak to one person the whole time that they're away and I and I don't think that you have to kind of look very far <laughs> for conversation if you want it when you're traveling on your own. I mean, I've always met people um, as I've traveled, either, um, you know, if you have a guide and especially if you're on your own, a guide will give you a little bit more attention and you'll, you'll end up getting a really great ex personal experience. But I've never um, struggled if I wanted to if I wanted to really chat with people, you know, you, could, you or I felt I could always um, there's always people around you that are, that are really happy to chat in a bar or in your hotel or wherever you might be. Yeah, definitely. And I think sometimes people kind of take pity on you, which isn't the right thing to do. No. Couples, couples would look at me and say, do you want to join us for breakfast? Or, yeah, do you yeah, want yeah. to come over with us? And yeah. say, no, I'm, I'm okay. Well, that's really kind of you. Thank you. Some yeah. people just don't quite understand that you're okay being alone. Absolutely. That's one yeah. of the, and I, I completely get that. What I remember, <coughs> um, could everybody just mute, please? I don't know, this, we're getting a bit of background noise. If you haven't already gone on mute, that would be great. Thank you. Um, or maybe I can mute everybody, but then I think it mutes you, Lisa, so we don't oh, want to. Maybe mute everyone and I'll unmute myself. Okay, here we go. Let's try that. I'm muting everyone. There you go. Can, you can unmute Lisa. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. That's great. Thanks, everyone. Um, one of the worst experiences, it was so disappointing. I'd gone to this incredible place in India and it had taken me days to get there. And I was staying in this fabulous uh, old Indian fort with a beautiful tented accommodate. It was gorgeous. And I went down for the first evening I had my dinner and then I think there were only maybe like six tables and there was a couple at the side of me from Scotland and we were chatting over dinner. And then the next day when I went for my breakfast, they'd asked for my table setting to be put on their table without asking me. So suddenly I was then with them for all my meals and I was really upset about it. I just, I, and I did not have the nerve to say, 
sorry, I don't want to sit with you. And I realized that they'd probably been chuffling together far too long and they were a bit fed up with each other. And I was sort of rent a crowd. Um, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> Somebody wants to, people ask you to join and you don't want to join them. It's quite an, a delicate thing to say, no, thank you. Yeah. yeah, but I think when you're traveling by yourself, you're a, is, you're a bit of an enigma. Is that the right word? So people are curious and they want to know why you're traveling by yourself. They want to know your story. And also, like you say, if they're couples who've been married quite a long time, because I'm when I travel by myself, I'm obviously more observant than when I would be with someone else. So the amount of couples that I look at over dinner and they're not really talking. And um, and so I guess maybe having someone else sat with them yeah. just gives yeah. them something it to talk about. Attention. <laughs> <laughs> the terrible thing to say. I probably was that couple at one point in my life. I, hope my I thought I was too. I never think <laughs> thought of anything to say ever, but possibly, yeah, could have been. So, um, so we both talked about how we got started, you know, coming, you know, having traveled, love travel and going through my divorce and wanting to start. But I mean, things that I struggle with even now are, you know, where to go. Like, how do you choose where to go? And once you've chosen where you want to go, how, <laughs> I said, Joanna Thruppel, I love that. <laughs> In the comments below, we're invited to, to become Thrupples as solo travelers. That's a great one. <laughs> so, um. How do you choose where to go? And once you've decided where you want to go, how do you choose, you know, where to stay? So, you know, we were talking about this before we sort of went live, how you, which areas or which hotels or is it a hotel, is it an Airbnb? I mean, what are your thoughts on that, Lisa? So how to choose where to go? If you've never travelled solo before, um, then possibly look for somewhere that has the same language that you speak so there are so many obviously different countries that speak English but that just really helps if you get stuck getting around just you don't have that anxiety about the language barrier so I'd definitely choose somewhere that speaks English or even if English isn't their first language there's so many countries in Europe that do speak English very well absolutely yeah um, also look for somewhere that's got really good tourism infrastructure. So um, maybe a mainstream destination, a very popular destination at first, because there's a reason that a lot of people go there and a lot of solos go there. So obviously places in Europe or possibly some places in the Caribbean as well. The Caribbean isn't just for couples. I've spent three months in the Caribbean solo and saw a bit of a different side to it. So Anywhere that's kind of geared up for tourism is a good way of deciding where to go. And also think about what you're looking for. Are you looking for a week's beach vacation or do you want to go sightseeing? Do you want to learn how to cook Thai cuisine or Italian cuisine? So think about things that interest you. Possibly also think about any experience on your bucket list that you haven't done yet so if you want to see lava one of mine is to see lava um in a volcano I've never ever seen that even though I've been to 145 countries now 142 crikey and 110 by myself I've never seen lava in a right. volcano so I would choose one of my next destinations to be somewhere that has one of them get something on your bucket list yeah it's a really good yeah 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 if you have traveled before and maybe you want to just you might want to go to a destination that does speak a slightly different language I know quite a few people especially from North America speak a bit of Spanish anyway so as long as you know basic Spanish don't let that stop you from going to Spanish-speaking countries because you can get by on basic Spanish if if I could do it then anyone can do it I have to say I've never really found like the only place I found um found language an issue was my very second solo trip and I went to Argentina and I did it all wrong and if I went back I would do it I went to Buenos Aires and I struggled and it was not a great experience and I everything everything was wrong the rock that chose the wrong hotel I was in the wrong part of town I didn't speak a word of Spanish blah 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 um that's the only place everywhere else I've always felt and it's really arrogant isn't it just that we could travel the world and speak English but um generally speaking I think if you you can get help with translations um apps and things but I think generally speaking you can communicate reasonably well um if you even if you don't yeah. speak 
I mean, I, I totally agree with you on bucket lists. The other thing that drives me too, because I'm such a foodie, and so I watch all these travel shows on telly and I watch all these chefs who travel around everywhere, like Rick Stein. I don't know if people, everybody on the call, the call will know Rick Stein. He's a very famous British chef, but he travels all over the world. He's kind of like, I'm trying to think of some of um, I, Oh, I like to watch on Netflix, uh, Netflix something about um, feeding Phil. And it's um, that guy who... Uh, comedian goes off all around the world and and he goes in search of you know food food destinations I love um I love watching those and that's really inspired me to kind of take I have actually sort of quite literally followed in the footsteps of these people and gone to the same place somebody feed Phil thank you Rima that's exactly it and um so that's a big drive for me because I am pretty much I'm, I'm very obsessed um with food but then just also general t I mean I you know if you're watching um, documentaries and things that will inspire you. I've yet to see the Northern Lights. That's big on my bucket list for hopefully 2024. But um, yeah, it's it's quite difficult sometimes to narrow it down, isn't it? Yeah. And also something I realised lately in my community, because we have Share Sunday, so I post an experience that I've had and I ask if anyone, or an experience that I want to do and ask if anyone else has had it or they want to do it. And the amount of women interested in visiting a country for a sports event. Yeah. I was really surprised. So even considering watching a Formula One event and then you can yeah. travel after that or before that or watching the US Tennis Open, going for a music festival. I was going to say music. That's a big one at the moment. Lots of ladies yeah. posting in the group about they've got tickets for Coldplay and all kinds. Lots of them keep coming up. Yeah. So they travel, you know, wherever to see them. Yeah. Yeah. I think the beauty of when you do that as well is that you you would probably meet somebody at the event as well that you can then spend yeah, some time. Yeah. Yeah. Mutual connection, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and, and other things that I've done in the past, which I think have worked really quite well as a solo, although I have to say this year, it really bit me in the bum. So it backfired big time. But traveling out of season because uh, I don't need to stick to school holidays or, or you know, so I can go in slightly uh, less expensive times of the year. So it does make travel a little bit more affordable. But, um, you know, looking at the shoulder season seasons to go or looking at um, out of season. I've done really well with that in the past, going places like India, Sri Lanka, Caribbean, and out of season, you get some really good deals as well, which is quite, um, you know, kind of saves a bit on the expenses too. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good idea. Um, and obviously checking the weather as well when you're going out of season, because that could narrow down, make yeah. a list of all your destinations and then narrow down which ones you can go to in the time that you have available because you don't want to be going in the Caribbean when it's hurricane season or right yeah. monsoon season depending on what you want to do obviously if you want to lie on a beach you don't want to be there during monsoon yeah season. I got really stung by that this year I went to Mauritius in January and it was supposed to be a really lovely fly and flop and I did know it was the rainy season but every um you know, I was tracking the weather and it was fine. There was a little bit of rain, you know, in the overnight, what have you. And the day I the day I arrived, the heavens opened and it poured with rain to the point where they pretty much closed almost the whole island for the whole week. Did not leave the resort at all. For didn't leave my hotel. Didn't even leave my room for most days. I mean, it was so torrential. It was really depressing. I just spent the whole week reading books and watching Netflix. It was awful. And then the day that I was supposed to come back um, was the only day that the kind of sun came through the clouds for a minute. And, and um, I, the only thing I saw was the route from the airport to my hotel and back again. I never, I didn't see anything. So that didn't work since you don't always have fabulous holidays. <laughs> when you... Yeah, that's such a shame, but that's taken out of your hands, isn't it? Yeah, that's... yeah, yeah, well. And so how do you, what do you look for then when you're choosing a hotel or a place to stay? Do you do Airbnb? I know you 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 have done hostels. I have never done hostels. Um, I think you have. Um, what do you, what do you look for? I did hostels for 20 years. So I only stopped doing hostels last year. So I was 46. Keep forgetting how old I am. And um, I used to really love staying in hostels because of the social aspects of it. and 
generally some of the places also have a cafe as well and they organize walking tours and they have nightly activities and not necessarily party activities but the one I stayed in Seville for example in Spain you could go and you could watch a flamenco show so you know that you're going to be going with a group and all you've got to do is go downstairs meet them at the front desk and then you're taken there and you're taken back so it was very easy and you can stay in private rooms in hostels it doesn't have to be dormitories but I do know women who are over 50 who are staying in dormitories and hostels oh yeah and I yeah they're, they're not I think the old reputation of hostels were that they're just for young backpackers but they're not really they are ageless so they are a good option if you if you want to really be sociable um now I stay in hotels I'm turning into a little bit of a princess I think <laughs> I think I've I've backpacked a lot and I've tried to keep the cost down with so many trips but now for me I want to be so comfortable and if my environment is really comfortable and I can have a quiet room where I go to sleep at the end of the night then I'm then I'm really happy so that is more priority for me when I go to a place now so I look for I don't normally look for international hotels yeah I look for yeah I look for smaller hotels because I find them a a bit cozier and b the chance to meet meet people more yeah and you're not just a number people know you and and you can strike a conversation if you want to yeah 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 and also ones that have got common areas or a lobby where people sit or they organize your tours for you um and they can organize I always whenever I fly in if I'm flying in at night time I always ask wherever I'm staying to organize the transfer from yeah. the airport to where I'm staying and that is a non-negotiable for me now because it, it just yeah just makes me, it's easier yeah. for me it is easier and th- there is that thing isn't there where you get your bag and you come out finally and you're in a completely foreign country and it's goodness knows what time of night and everyone's jabbering and people with signs and if you don't know what you're doing it can be quite um a scary moment so if you've got I always organize pick up um like you say, either via the hotel or if I'm even with Airbnb, I think you can organize pickups now or you can certainly uh, organize things. Um, because I, unless it's someone that I'm very familiar with, I would never just kind of breeze out and jump into a taxi and just take, take me wherever I need. I feel a lot more comfortable being met. Yeah. yeah. And I and I, I love it, Airbnbs actually. I think they're getting quite expensive though now. Well, everything's getting expensive now. Um, that's kind of, um, you know, post COVID at least it's all seems to have gone up terribly, but um, I like, I like an Airbnb and I love then because we, we haven't talked about eating out yet, but we can talk about that too. Cause I know that's a subject security and eating out. They're two big ones. I know. Um, but I do like an Airbnb again, depending on where, where I am. If I know where, if I know the city or the destination, an Airbnb is great because I can find my way around and I'm happy with that. If I'm going to a new place and like you, I like a nice sort of boutique smallish hotel where you feel well looked after. And cruising, I have never cruised. And I, um, I know it is so popular for um, solo ladies to cruise and for me personally I've never um I've I've never really thought about it to be honest I've always thought oh no it's not for me and I've so I've never done it have you crew you have cruised I remember you have cruised I worked on a cruise ship yeah that's right yeah yeah I I understand why people go on cruise ships because all you have to do is turn up you go or even when I was working on the cruise ship you're just your home is on the cruise ship all your stuff is there you don't have to unpack and keep packing and then you've got the beauty of just arriving into different ports, getting off the boat, exploring, get tours made for you. you. There are people on the ship, you know, you've got ready-made company there. And then you just get back on and you've got your bed at night. So I, I definitely see the advantages of cruising for for solo females as well. And you've got all the nightly entertainment. You've just got everything. Nowadays, the cruise ships seem like luxury hotels with everything you can imagine. Yeah, I mean, I do fancy the, I, I do f- quite fancy like the smaller cruises, I think, where the, kind of the smaller, and I think I'm sure that I, I haven't even looked into it, so I don't know, but I think some of them are more, some can be sort of, you know, children or what have you, and you can kind of end up sort of with a slightly sort of 
smaller group that would probably appeal more than but I think it's a great <clears throat> this is we're talking about places to stay I mean that's yeah. a great that's a great option for lots of people you know to if, if you if you're trying <clears throat> to um experience even a new country but just kind of going out on your own a cruise is a is a really good option yeah and um b&b's as well not yeah. not airbnb's but an actual bed and breakfast where you've got the normally a couple isn't it that are kind of hosting you and you get your bed and your breakfast and they're normally so welcoming aren't they and they really want guests and yeah, they and really so make you feel, yeah. yeah they really make you feel part of something so that gives you that that kind of welcoming uh, yeah that's a very good point As, I mean obviously in the UK and Ireland we have a lot of um, bed and breakfast but I mean I also remember staying in what was it is the equivalent of a bed and breakfast in uh, New Delhi and uh, it was the most fantastic place very small very welcoming and I met this incredible Australian lady who was traveling she was actually working um, there she had her own um, fabric um, she was there sourcing fabric she had her own um, company making clothes in Australia and um, I ended up meeting in the evening her and her colleague who was from New Delhi and we had the best night ever it was in the back of a tuk-tuk around it was absolutely brilliant <laughs> and I just met her over breakfast and we just kind of clicked and um, it's one of my one of my favorite experiences and uh, I would go back to India in a shot I loved it but um, she just that one meeting over breakfast in the bed and breakfast kind of left me with a really great you know memory of that of that particular trip so that's um yeah that was before I met the Scottish couple who then put me on their breakfast table that was further on that same trip <laughs> <laughs> so there are no questions look everyone's really quiet yeah and oh, please, ladies, please, please, chat anybody, when we're talking yeah. about topics. please to any questions you have put them in the chat box we'd be more we'll than happy to yeah yeah, or topics that you want us to cover. Let's talk about security then, because that's a big one, isn't it? Um, sure. Where do we start with that? I mean, do you want to? I have never, I don't believe, have I ever been in a situation where I didn't, I felt really unsafe? Um, no. Oh, here's a question. Patricia, we can answer that one next. But if we just go up with security for the moment, what are your top tips for security, staying safe? It's probably the general, the common ones now. It's depending on where you're going to, if there are chances of pickpockets or theft, which happens. Oh, hello, no, hello, sorry. <laughs> yeah, then um, just be very vigilant with with your valuables. I generally, when I travel alone, I look very poor. I don't look as though I have money and I don't... Um, wear expensive jewelry or an expensive watch or anything and I keep a little backpack on me and I make sure that it has a zip and in some places as well I also have the money belt which is also known as a fanny pack yeah um and I keep that underneath my clothes as well so I I always go by the rule that it's better to be over cautious than absolutely than <clears throat> the other thing yeah, yeah. and touch wood never been mugged never been pickpocketed or anything like that so um sorry the questions are coming and I need to not they look at the questions. Are. so I'll just uh, yeah <laughs> I, mean, I, I I do stay in touch now we've got mobile phones what did we do before I honestly don't remember what we did before mobile phones but um regarding staying in touch but I always will post like on my private Facebook or you know show that my members of the fa my family members that I'm kind of fine and doing okay and the other one that I think is a good one is um, I keep a printed copy of all my documents not just have everything on my phone so if I do lose my phone along the way or I have no wi-fi or it's out of out of battery I have a, 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 a proper kind of either a, a photocopy or written, um, you know, document numbers and things so that I can replace all of those. Because I think we, we tend to rely on our phone for everything now. And I just think, God, if you lost your phone, um, it, it, what would you do? I mean, you've got your boarding part, I mean, everything. So I do have a written kind of little dossier thing that I take with me as well. And That's just, yeah. Good to have. Really obvious things like you know stay out of the bad areas. I don't walk don't walk around at night on your own if it's not if it's not suitable. Um, those are very obvious things. I don't think any, we don't need to repeat all of those. But um, and yeah, touch wood so far no no problems. That's really good. 
I do feel as though it's becoming easier for women to travel solo in regards to safety, because even Uber, I think um, I do, I try not to use taxis now because you, wherever you go, you're going to get taxi drivers that rip you off anyway. And um, there are quite a lot of different unlicensed taxis. So I tend to use Uber or the equivalent of that. There's another one called Bolt and they're called different things in different countries. That's but right. with that, I think you've also, and it's generally quite safe because you can send the registration number or it, there's a button you can press and it sends it to one of your relatives or one of your friends. So they know your movements. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. I do think that's that's a really good thing for women traveling solo. But yeah, same as you, don't walk around at night by yourself. No, and no jewelry. I don't take my nice jewelry with me when I go anywhere. Not that I have much to be honest, but um the bits that I have I keep at home. So definitely. Yeah, and just avoid any areas that, that are known for um pickpockets or are not good areas and you can always ask where you're staying because they're local and they know which areas to avoid ramblers las ramblas in barcelona i'm pronouncing that terribly <coughs> that is <laughs> not for it anyway okay so we've got some questions this is really good so when you want to book a guide for tours while at a destination how do you find them that's a good question do you have I... any yep. oh sorry okay. <laughs> I jumped no in. no go ahead um yeah, so either go into your Facebook group and ask for recommendations or do a search for the destination. I think now it's so easy because so many women are traveling solo. So it's as if we're building a kind of list of recommendations of where we've all been in the world. And then if you know that another woman's used a tour guide and they recommend them, then you know that that tour guide is going to be good. I also use Get Your Guide, which is a platform that uses local guides in the country. And so I just look at reviews and then I book a guide through Get Your Guide because I know they're going to be local guides to that particular country. But generally recommendations from Facebook groups or Get Your Guide because I've never had a bad experience with Get Your Guide so far. No, no. And the free walking tours, somehow either you can find them by Googling or I mean, every city has has um, free walking tours and they generally meet at certain places. Um, that's the thing. I, I do follow people on Instagram and quite often on Instagram, you get so many tips there for um, various cities that you're going to. For example, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm going to Valencia and already I kind of figured out my three-day itinerary and I figured out where to rent my bike and this, so you can kind of get that ahead but is it do Airbnb booking.com and, and all of those I'm pretty sure that they do that now too if you if you booked a hotel through booking it'll um yeah someone's saying chip advisor absolutely you can um you can get um experiences that you can book through them as well so I've done some of those as well Airbnb I'm pretty sure have experiences that you can book so yeah yeah they do I haven't booked through them but I have heard they've got really good recommendations yeah. so um so gosh we've got lots of questions in coming in now so let's kind of whiz through these so the guide we've done have you stayed at a convent or a monastery no I haven't but I really want to have you stayed at any Lisa yeah I have I have and it's such an amazing experience you can, I've done silent meditation retreats. Meditation and wellness is becoming really big, actually, where people just want to travel and switch off. So you can, it's um, a very good experience to stay in a, in a monastery in Thailand or, well, for women, it's kind of equivalent, isn't it? It's like a nunnery. You could do them. I know there's all kinds of, uh, in Spain, in Portugal, all over Europe, you can stay in monasteries. And I don't know the names of these organizations, but they're definitely in the in the Solar and Star Facebook group because a lot of ladies have stayed there. Um, got a question on cruising. Um, I think we kind of answered that. Do you have an opinion on cruising? This is for you, Lisa. I think, <coughs> yes, that we, we thought it was a, it was a good way to travel. Right. Yeah, I think it's good for solo female travellers. Yeah, I um, I'm kind of, I think being on a cruise ship is good for solo female travellers. But I'm there's obviously the conscious side of the sustainable travel side of cruise ships. Right. And yeah, I cruises. know it's a, it's an argument, is it? I know, I know. But I mean, yeah. if you go down that route, you can question all travel. But I do yeah. feel a little bit like that. I yeah, let's. Let's kind of move on from that one. Um, written documents, is it safe to leave them in your suitcase in the hotel? That's a really good question. 
<clears throat> if there's a safe, then I would always leave it in the safe. I don't carry my documents around with me when I'm out and about, do you, Lisa? I leave them in the, you know, tend to leave them in the hotel. I wouldn't carry my passport unless I had to, if I was going to a bank for something or needed it. I would never carry my passport with me. If there isn't a safe, you can always just um, lock your suitcase with a little, take a little padlock. Yeah. And I, I, the hotel, ask them to keep it for you. That's yeah. In the olden days, that's what you had to do when there were no safes in the room. <laughs> and I keep a scan of my passport on my phone anyway. Yeah. So uh, what resources do you use to plan a trip? Any Oh, so this is a really good question. Can we, Sharon, um, can we come back to that one? Because Lisa is going to share with us this fantastic um workbook that she's created that is exactly for this so if we just go through these questions and then maybe that's a really we can talk then maybe we can ask you to share that lisa um sure. that's that's really um really will kind of line up very well what you'd like to cover um <coughs> a question about india i can't really comment on covid i'm afraid i don't think any of us can um um i've been on i've been solo to india twice and loved it um but a lot of people um, prefer to go in groups to India, and there are lots of groups that you can go with. Do you have any views on India um, at all? I've been to India twice by myself, and I think you just need to be, depending on which region you go to, you just need to be prepared for India because it can be a bit of a culture shock and it can be just an overload on all of your senses, yeah. and you see poverty there, and yeah. um, it, it's you just need to be prepared for it. Yeah, I mean, I think people, I think um, this, lots of American ladies will understand the mar what Marmite is, but it's something that we have in the UK that we spread on our toast and people either love it or hate it. So we have a saying that it's a bit, something can be like Marmite. I think India is quite like, I mean, I absolutely love India um, and every part, I, I know so little of it and I would love to explore more. The two bits that I went to were so different. The South was so, um, Quiet, much quieter, very beachy, very much like Sri Lanka, which is probably my favorite place in the whole world that I've been to. Whereas when I did the Golden Triangle, it's city, it's very full on. It's like you say, an assault on the senses, but I I loved all of it. So um, I think if I think Anne, if you're looking at it and you're feeling a little bit unsure, then maybe look at a group. I think that's a that's a great a great way of doing it. <laughs> How do you handle evenings? I know this is it. This going out alone at night. This is a really tough one, isn't it? For um, for lots of people. So why don't you start on that one, Elisa? And then I can maybe add if there's anything that, that I can add. There are so many evening tours you can do nowadays. So you can do culinary tours. So you can go and say we'll get your guide and you can meet a group. And you can go to three different restaurants and sample local food from three different restaurants in with a group. So that also gets over the awkward dining experience as well. Or you can go and you can, I've done this before in Barcelona, there was a tapas group where you go and you learn how to cook tapas and then you eat it with a group. So that's a good for, for an evening. You could always pick accommodation that has evening entertainment. You could see if there are any local festivals on during that time um what else would you do for evening entertainment yeah, I don't I, go up that much in the evening I generally read quite a lot in the evening yeah it depends it really does depend where you are doesn't it I mean if I am a, I love as I mentioned like exploring the food scene so I have done quite a lot of food tours you're absolutely right night food markets are brilliant but I yeah, quite night like, bars, yeah. yeah I quite like to have a like a long late lunch depending on where I am, obviously. Um, and that's a lovely thing to kind of sit, you know, with a, with a glass of wine or a drink or what have you, and kind of coffee, you know, stretch your lunch out, and then it kind of takes you into the early evening, and then you wander back to wherever you're staying, and you actually, like, then are happy just to either sit on your terrace with a book, if you've, if, if, again, depending on where you are. So, and I am also, I use, I use my tra travel as a time to read more. I don't read enough anymore. I'm so busy when I'm at home. And I always seem to put reading on the back burner. So for me, that's a big thing. Um, so yeah, so I, um, and some places it's difficult. I completely understand. And you do end up perhaps spending more time in your room than you would want to, but um, but um, there are lots of things that you, I mean, I must did a night a cycle ride in Bangkok, which was fantastic. Amazing. Hotel, yeah, that was great. 
There yeah. seems to be more night tours now. And like you were saying, there's the night markets as well. I think if you're staying on an island, generally, um, depending on oh, the Hilda, area. You're, I don't, we can hear you, Hilda. Can you um, just go on mute, please? I can't find him. <laughs> where's Hilda? Where's Hilda? Oh, maybe try and mute everybody yeah, again and then I'll mute you. Hilda. It's all right. I, I found her. Okay. So, more messages. Get your guide. We've done that. Trip advisor for recommendations. Absolutely. The US State Department issues travel warnings for countries. If your country issues them, how much attention do you pay to them? I would personally not go to a place if um, the UK government issued a warning about it. But it depends what level. If they issued a do not travel warning, but there are warnings for all kinds of countries that are really quite um, low grade. Is that the word? Is that the, I'm not sure. Yeah. I personally think they exercise more on. Um, what's that saying? On the caution side. On the of side it. of caution. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So I have been in countries before where things have been happening. And when you look at the Foreign Office website, website it would tell you don't go to that country at all. Whereas I know personally, because I've been on the ground there, is that it's only a specific area that's been, that's affected. I've also traveled a lot in West Africa, not necessarily by myself, but there are a lot of countries that the Foreign Office tell you not to go to, and they've been fine going to. But I would say, if the whole country is red, because they do it in green, which means it's fine to go to certain areas, yellow, which is kind of, they kind of advise not really going to if you don't have to, and then red, which is a no-go. So if a country is red, then I wouldn't go there because I also think your travel insurance isn't validated as I well. I was just exactly the same thing. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that if your government issues a, a warning of do not travel, then your travel insurance is valid. And we haven't even talked about travel insurance, but I would just say everybody has should have it for every trip that they ever do, always non-negotiable. Um, Definitely. But Patricia, it'd be interesting if, if there are particular countries that you're thinking about going to that the US is saying that you shouldn't go to them, just put them in the chat. And because I've been to quite a few and I can tell you what, in my experience when I was there, what I, you know, how it was. So um, any recommendations for um, meditation retreats in Europe? I have not been on a meditation retreat. Have you been on one recently, Lisa? I that signed up for one in, oh, sorry. I think that you could recommend. Yeah. I signed up for one in near Barcelona, actually. Last year, I didn't end up going. But um, there is a platform called Book Retreats. I, just, I think it's called Book Retreats. It's definitely called Book Yoga Retreats, but they also do retreats as well. And I found this retreat through this particular platform. And it gives reviews. And you can search by... Um, the duration of time that you want to go and the price and everything as well and you don't have to share a room you can upgrade and you can have your own private room but there are going to be so many meditation retreats in Europe Portugal is becoming quite a hot spot for meditation and wellness retreats Spain you'll find them as well um, yeah healing holidays has a few as well that you can look on that that website healing holidays um, oh, okay I'll type that in yeah but they 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 um they tend to be a little bit sort of slightly old fashioned spas, but I think that they are doing a lot more on wellness um, and meditation. If you're looking for a silent meditation retreat, which I did in Australia, it, there's um I think the site was Vipassana Meditation, and then they give you a, a they have retreats in all different countries, and they're proper silent retreats so you can go on. Okay. So Robin's telling us that she's leaving for Bruges on May the 2nd. How nice. That's lovely. Wow. Bruges is gorgeous. Have a lovely time, Robin. Yeah. So Laurie, what's Laurie? I'm not going to tour yet, but arranging airline seems non-stop. Keeps getting... Oh, okay. Yeah, organised. So you're asking about um, booking air travel, I guess. Yeah. I've not... noticed, I don't know about you, but I've noticed that the prices of like you were saying earlier the prices of flights and the price of accommodation are really expensive at the moment but 
I feel as though that is pent up travel. Um, oh, I'm losing my way. demand, sort of everybody yeah. travel after now. COVID. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that will die down a little bit next year. Um, but I've been quite surprised at the airlines that I've been looking at, and a lot of them aren't non-stop as well. So um, the, if you use Skyscanner or Google Flights, something else that I do now is just Google what airlines fly to the particular destination that I'm going to. And I go direct on that airline because I don't think those two particular platforms have all the specific airlines on them. So you're saying it's more about the timing and how to orchestrate, as in like when to book your flight once you've booked your accommodation, maybe. Yeah, she's not, sorry, yes. Yeah, that's hard, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I know. Um, I like, I mean, if you're going in a group, and so I know this from experience from the solo in style group trips that we're organizing, we ask people not to book their flights until we know that we've got enough people that the tour is definitely going to go ahead. Otherwise you're left with a, a flight that, that we that you maybe have to kind of then get a, a rebate on or whatever. But as soon as I know I'm going somewhere and I I know I'm definitely going, I book straight away. Um, and if you can try and book weekend, you know, try and avoid weekends and Tuesday apparently is the cheapest date and all of that stuff. I mean, I just don't think there are any great, um, I use points, I collect British Airways points on a BA Amex. I mean, lots of people collect points and try and use those. It's, um, yeah, it is just um, expensive these days and it's hard, yeah, it's hard. I have no real great thoughts on how to get a cheap flight deal anymore. I really don't. You can sign up for a price alert through Skype Scanner and then it emails you when the price goes down and the price goes up. So same as you, just um, or, or as soon as you know your dates, then maybe just have a look at the flights and just keep an eye on it just for a few days. I've tried to do that, though, and then the price has just gone up and up and up. And I thought, I just need to book it now. Yeah, I know. You, you end up with that whole debate with yourself, don't you, about, shall I book it now? Oh, I'll just leave another day. Oh, and then it's, that's gone up and then, oh, it might come down. It's just like you fight the bullet, yeah. Okay, we've got one last on travel insurance, and then Lisa, we can hand over to you to share, for you to share your planning workbook with us. That would be great. So thoughts on travel insurance. I never leave home without it ever. And and I think um, in, as in the UK, I can only speak for the UK, I would say everybody, I mean, everybody has travel. It never really crosses your mind not to have it. But I do understand because a lot of ladies in the, in the Facebook group are based in the US and it's, it's perhaps less common. Personally, I think you have to have it. Uh, but I, I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. Um, yeah, I've, never no, it, I've never had to use it, but I'm always glad I've got it. Yeah, it's just, it's a reassurance, isn't it? That if something does go wrong, especially medically, yeah. the amount of horror stories I've heard of people who have been stuck in hospitals in Thailand or somewhere else and they've broken a leg or, you know, something unexpected has happened and then the price of the hospital bill has been pretty high. So it's always, I just think it's always worth having at least medical insurance when you travel. I agree. And um, I mean, there are ladies who post in the group, their situations have broken ankles, broken bones, and they've oh. uh, cancelled trip flight, cancellate, you know, everything. And in fact, for the tours that we're offering, this we don't do many, but the ones that we are offering, we are m mandating is a strong word, but we are strongly recommending that people take travel insurance. So. Okay, so... Uh, I'm going to hand over to Lisa now. Uh, if you want to share your screen, Lisa, Lisa's developed all kinds of amazing tools. One of the questions was, you know, how do you, what do you use to plan your trip? Which is a really great way of lining up, Lisa, if you want to share um, your workbook. And I would encourage you all to look at Lisa's website when we finish. She has so many resources. And in fact, um, for everybody who's on the call today, we've got an offer on this workbook. Um, I'll send a link out to that in um in an email when I share the recording where Lisa's offering 50% off access to this great tool should anybody be interested. So over to you, Lisa. Can you, it says host disabled participants. Oh, yeah, let me do that. Please give me permission. Okay. Can you do it now? Ta-da. Can you see? You can. 
And by the way, keep asking your questions. If you've got any more, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat box. Okay, so I used to find planning a trip quite overwhelming. So I developed a, a workbook with a 12 step process to booking my trip. And I use this for booking all of my trips. And um, yeah, and I've been on to 142 countries now, but I just find this really useful. So the first step, I'm gonna go quite slowly. And then if anyone has any questions, they can just post it in as, as I go. So I kind of covered this a bit earlier, but the first step is to make a list of everywhere that you've ever wanted to go to help you find the right solo destination for you. And make a list of all the bucket, exp bucket list experiences that you've ever wanted to do, whether you want to dive in the Great Barrier Reef, maybe you want to see the pyramids in Egypt. This workbook is actually clickable as well, so you can, you can tailor make it and write down your ideas. If you're unsure of where to go or you don't really have any bucket list destinations, or as I like to call them, travel wish list destinations, I've got this little, um, these little click circles here where you can go down and you can think about all the different type of activities that you like to do. So maybe you're into adventure, maybe you're into cities, you love the desert, maybe you travel for movie tourism. That's quite a big one that people travel to, like Dubrovnik, for example, for the Game of Thrones scenery. Yeah. So you can fill in that section. And then you just write down your examples from that list. So example number one would be Peru and bucket list experiences, hike to the top of Machu Picchu. Other experiences that you can do there, you can see the Arus tribe on Lake Titicaca, activities there. So it's good if I wanted to hike. And the benefits of traveling there is if it's got good tourism infrastructure. And but if I speak basic Spanish, it's okay, I'm gonna get by. So this first section just gives you an opportunity to write down all of the countries that you've ever wanted to go to, to give you some ideas. Then once you've done that, the second stage is to see how long you can go for. So you might be restricted by work or family commitments. Maybe you've only got two weeks off in the summer period. So you can write it in this section here. And then out of the list that you've just devised from the first chapter, so say you've only got a long weekend and you're in North America, then obviously it's not worth flying somewhere for a few hours. So you might just want to have a look at some short haul flights, which means flights that are only just for a few hours. So you can just write down here any recommendations or any um, anywhere that you can just go for a long weekend. If you can only go for a week, same here, have a look at your selection and write down for a week. If you want to go to Australia, for example, then obviously you wouldn't want to just do that for a week. Okay, and then you just compare that to your list of countries and shortlist the ones that you do have time for when you're looking to book your next trip. Make sure that, you, or this is more for kind of overlanders, but if you do have a couple of weeks and there are two countries that you want to go to that are neighboring each other, maybe you can combine the two. So if you want to go to Spain and Portugal, you could do maybe a week in each one. And then you come to your conclusion of which solo trip you actually want to do for this particular trip and what you're going to concentrate on. Next section is when to go. So when can you actually travel? And then you, I've also got links in the workbook as well that take you to the best time to travel to particular um, destinations in particular countries. So then just make sure that the time that you're going is going to be okay weather-wise, you know, it's not hurricane season, it's not Ramadan, which is actually happening at the moment in the Middle East and in Dubai. But I'm just writing a post on travel during Ramadan. Um, and then you can shortlist your country as well here. And then visas. This is one of the big deciders for me on where I'm going to next, especially because I want to see countries that are quite emerging. 
So I do check, I go through my list and I have a look at which ones are easier for me to get a visa on. And there are a lot of countries now that seem to be opening up and doing e-visas where you can just apply for them online. And some other countries allow you to get visas on arrival. So this is also something to take into consideration. Is it an e-visa? Do you actually need to go to the embassy and apply in person? How long does it take to process? A lot of the visa sites do tell you how long it's going to take. So if it's last minute, then um, do check this before you actually book any flights or anything. So you want to make sure you need the visa before, before you go there. Then there is a website that I use called iVisa. Just type it in here. And they give you um, recommended visas that you need for particular nationalities. Next one is vaccinations. Because I travel quite frequently, I'm always up to date with my vaccinations. So the hepatitis ones, tetanus, polio. And if you're going to Africa, for example, or I don't know, some exotic place where you might need yellow fever, then just have a look and make sure that you do have your vaccinations for that particular country or that you can get them in time before you go there. So something I haven't had, for example, are my baby shots. And I know that I need to have three shots for that. And it's over a period of more than a month. So if I do want to go to a country where you need rabies, I need to make sure that I plan for at least a month before to do that. Also check with malaria tablets, but malaria tablets, I know in England, they can just be bought over the counter and you can take them one to two days before you travel. So that's not a problem. I've also created a travel budget planner where you can figure out the cost of what your trip's gonna be and whether that trip is affordable for you. So this is something slightly different to the workbook, but say if you've costed up a trip to Sri Lanka for two weeks and it's over the budget you wanted to pay, you could then maybe cost up another country and see if it's under the budget, or you could reduce your two week trip in Sri Lanka to 10 days for example, to keep it within your budget. Are there any questions so far? Am I going a nothing, bit too far? No, nothing at the moment, but um, this is all really good practical stuff, yeah. And then booking flights. So if you're going long haul, which basically just means long distance, um, consider having a stopover. So if you're flying with Emirates, I'm gonna use Dubai as an example, and their main hub, so the place that they stop is Dubai, then you have to stop in Dubai and change planes anyway before you fly on to somewhere like Asia. So what you might want to do in that case is maybe see if it's possible to break the flights up and just stay one or two nights overnight at that particular stopover. I've done that before and I stayed in Hong Kong for a few nights and I wouldn't have probably gone to Hong Kong if I hadn't have had that as a stopover. So that's also a way of seeing another destination en route to where you're heading to. And some airlines, I know TAP, which are the Portuguese airline, they used to offer um, the chance for stopovers in Portugal on the way to the destination. So you can check, you can also just check with the airline if that's something that they offer. Um, that's a bit more about flights. Something I have noticed now, I've act, I'm actually having an interview with um, Brooke from um, Pack. She does packing your luggage. So she's doing a workshop with, where she helps you go on a plane with just basically a backpack. So you don't take any luggage with you apart from like a handbag size backpack. She's really into helping people pack light. And I've got an interview with her on Wednesday, actually. So something that I have noticed recently since COVID is that a lot of the airlines are charging for baggage. So even if the price of the airfare seems very reasonable, make sure that you check and find out how much they charge you to, to take your bags on as well, because it might be worth comparing that flight with a larger airline that includes your, your luggage for within that price if that makes sense. Yeah. 
And then, so then you decided where to go. You've got your, you've organised your visa, you've got your vaccinations, you've, yeah, now you need to just plan what you want to do there. So if I take the Peru example, and then obviously to see and do there, you've got Machu Picchu, which is amazing, by the way. And then the Urus people on Lake Titicaca, there's the Sacred Valley, Lima, Amazon. You can also see a llama in Cusco. So in this section, you can write down what there is to see and do. And then think, can I actually do this by myself or do I need to book a tour? Because if you do book a group tour for some or all of your tour, for some or all of your trip, then if there's so many things that you want to do and you're unsure how to get around and see them all, then a group tour is a bit easier because they arrange every single thing for you. So actually, if you are looking at group tours, do that before you book your flights anyway. But I do use Get Your Guide just to get ideas for what to do in a particular city. So I would type in Barcelona, for example, and then it brings up the best things to do in Barcelona. And TripAdvisor also is very good for that. So the next section is how to get around. A website that I swear by and I absolutely love is Rome to Rio, this one here. And it shows you how to get from place to place. So it shows you how to get from, uh, say Bangkok airport into Bangkok. And it gives you the buses, the Metro, how much a taxi is gonna cost. It really helps you be able to plan your trip. That's a godsend room to Rio. I use it all the time. Yeah. And they've just, it's all over the world now, isn't it, yeah, really? Yeah, it is, yeah. And next, look at where to stay. So researching where to stay, you could ask in the Facebook group and just ask for recommendations on areas for where to stay. I'm actually, I've got solo destination guides on my site and I'm adding in the best areas to stay now to all the guides. Um, so getting recommendations and I use booking.com to research my accommodation. It's generally based on price. And then I also look at reviews. What I really like about them is that they give reviews. You can search under solo travelers as well. So if there are a lot of solo travellers that have stayed in a particular property and they've given it good reviews, I know that that's going to be really good for solos. Whereas if there's a lot of couples there or a lot of family reviews, then I tend to stay away from that one and look for more solo ones. And also just about if you're arriving into the airport late at night, you can contact your accommodation to see if they can arrange the air airport transfer. Uh, next one is insurance. If you write down what you need from your insurance, because I think the majority of insurance companies only used to cover you up to 2000 meters. So if you're looking at doing any trekking or going to mountainous destinations, or you wanna climb a volcano, then you would need to contact them and just make sure that the activity that you wanna do is covered. Especially if you're really into adventure and you wanna be doing bungee jumping or something like that <clears throat> and also annual cover if you're looking at doing a few trips in a year annual cover might be a good opportunity for you to save a bit of money rather than doing separate trip insurance for each one and something I also do because I travel with my laptop and it's my work I also get additional cover for my personal items so I make sure that my laptop don't have a camera I make sure that my laptop and my phone is included within the insurance uh, the companies that I do use other people have probably got ones that they want to recommend as well but I use true traveler I think they are for UK and European citizens but World Nomads is for North Americans as well. And Safety Wing is also worldwide. So I've used all of those three insurance companies. Um, disclaimer, I haven't had to claim through any of them. So I can't speak about how good they are at paying out for a claim. I did used to work for an insurance company. And I know that 
if they don't have to pay out in my experience then they generally will try not to so just make sure that you read the small print for what you want covered so yeah there, those are the just 12 steps that I use to plan a trip and then the next stage after this, I guess, would be to go into the Facebook group and say, I'm going to Sri Lanka in June for two weeks. Does anyone does anyone have any tips on restaurants or um, any other tools or things I could do in the evening? Or is anybody else going to be there at the same time? Yep. Thank you, Lisa. So we didn't get any more questions during. Um... Oh, wow. If you want, if you want to stop sharing, because we um, yeah, it's gonna. Uh, have you finished? Sorry, uh, have you finished, or did you have anything? No, I was, like gonna... Oh. I was gonna share um, that the workbook is actually part of a bundle that I put together, which is called a solo travel starter bundle. So I'll just show you it, just in case it's relevant for anybody. So I created this for kind of first time solo travelers. So it's a kit, it's a digital kit. So it's for people who are unsure if they can really travel alone. And if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed at planning your trip, there's also a course on it, which has got a video course that runs you through 12 steps in more details as well. And if you want to feel more confident traveling solo and you're planning your first solo trip and you don't really know where to go. I've written a book on a female guide to solo travel that's now the second revision of that and the first part of that book is all about the the mindset and the empowerment and the confidence to travel solo because it's all very well just saying to people you can do it you can travel alone but I think you need to get over those mental barriers of whether you can do it by yourself and other people kind of projecting their fear onto you that you can't like, why would you want to do that? Why do you want to go there? So all the first chapter is all about mindset and overcoming the roadblocks. And then it's plan your trip. And then it's how to cope when you're by yourself on the road. If you get homesickness, for example, um, what to do in the evenings. I also have an article about what to do in the evenings on the blog. And then the final chapter is how to cope when you get back home. Because I think when you travel it's so exciting most of the time you have all those endorphins flowing around your body and then when you get back home it can you get those holiday blues don't you good point yeah <laughs> so I've covered that in the books I thought well that's also very important and it's normally 29.99 so I think in dollars it's about 25.99 um but if, um for your community Deborah there's a 50 percent discount code so people can get it half price if they want to get it and I think did you say you were going to send around an yeah. email before yeah. yeah yeah I'll send an email once I get the recording of the whole session I'll send an email out and I'll include the link and the discount code in that um, so anybody who wants access to all of those tools um, I think it's 50% off right so that's um do you also want me to put it in the chat now as well, just in case I could put the website name in the chat? Do we have to have the special uh, URL for the ladies to use? No, it's um, it's a normal URL. Oh, it's, just, it's, the, oh, it's the code. Oh, yeah. yeah, let me just. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me just get the code. So it's go solo for the code and then you get 50% off and then you, you can download it straight away. But um, I hope that that just gives you, I know it's quite, still quite a lot of information, but I hope that that just gives you a bit more idea of how. No, that's great. Thank you very much. And we didn't get any more questions. We did have one comment, though, from um, Frances, who, Frances, who says, beware if you're using the, an e-visa platform that you make sure that you're on the right one. And uh, there are some that are less scrupulous, I think, than others. So that's um, I think the one that you recommended I have used before, which is legitimate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you, Francis. So um, I feel as though we've kind of covered pretty much everything, unless there are any last minute, sorry, my phone's dinging, unless there are any last minute things that um, anybody would like to ask. Um, I think um, it feels like we've come to a, a natural conclusion. So um, any last minute questions? No, yes, no. 
Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, is there anybody who wants to go solo, but they're they're just a, are still a bit afraid about it and just need a bit of extra encouragement or what's stopping you from, from thinking that you can do it? Feel free to put that in the chat. Or maybe everyone's fired up and ready to go. Maybe, maybe I, if I could figure out how to unmute everybody, I could. Unmute. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Joanne, you put your hand up. There you go. Joanne's um, saying that she's feeling a little bit insecure about getting started. Um, how do I unmute? I'm sure if, if you want to, if you want to chat amongst yourselves whilst I figure that one out. Um, but Joanne, yes, I think I unmuted. Oh, there you go. You unmuted yourself. There you go. Perfect. So we do have at least Joanne who's feeling a little bit unsure about getting started. And I just have to I just have to say that because I travel in the US a lot by myself, but I'm usually going to see a relative. So I'm going from point A to point B. My only apprehension about traveling overseas, and I really want to go to Ireland and Scotland, is that I'm by nature a very shy person. And I think my shyness holds me back a lot. I mean, people like my daughter, when she gets on an airplane, somebody sitting next to her will always chat her up. I have never once had anyone speak to me on an airplane. <laughs> I never speak to people on planes. On, I just don't. I just don't. I'm afraid. I, I, I like quiet time on a plane, so I never ever engage anybody on a plane. Um, but I, well, if you're thinking of going to Scotland and Ireland, I would say that's one of the best places to go if you're feeling even mm -hmm. remotely um, shy. Is because certainly it's such a friendly, warm, welcoming place to go. Um, I think you would be feel like you know you belong there the minute that you land. And certainly in Ireland, it's renowned for its friendliness and hospitality. And Scotland's the same. They're both really great places to go to. Um, so I wouldn't, I really wouldn't let that stop you. Of course, it's very easy for us to say that, but um, I'm sure that you would feel very comfortable very quickly. I was going to say that as well. Those two destinations are probably the best destinations you can pick. And I've actually just written a guide. Can I put the link in the blog, actually? I've just written a guide on Ireland um, that was published this, this month, which might help. Um, so I just, that's the name of my website, girlaboutheglobe.com. Yeah. I guess the question is, do, do you want people to talk to you? Or are you happy going and just, do you just want your alone time anyway? If you want people to talk to you, you are going to the right destinations for people who will just strike up a conversation with you, no problem. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do, it's just that I, because of the way I am, my personality, I can't carry the conversation. And so if I don't have someone that will keep engaging me, I tend to just withdraw. The Irish, that what is that <laughs> saying? They taught the hind legs of a donkey, which means it maybe someone here is Irish, but um, they talk and talk and talk and talk and talk because I'm not much of a talker, I'm more of a listener. But you meet an Irish person or a Scottish person and there is no silence at all. They will fill in the gaps for you. <laughs> and um, Patricia, you have, your, you have raised your virtual hand. Yes, I'm um, okay traveling solo to bigger cities because I've been to Ireland. I went to Iceland by myself. I was on the tour. It was like a solo tour in big cities. But the smaller cities, like what I would really like to do is drive through Italy. Well, maybe not because I've heard the roads are really windy and stuff. But just going to smaller places, <laughs> yeah. I guess sort of I'm concerned about safety. And since I don't speak the language, but I was in Italy once and I... I Learned how to say how much does this cost. So I practiced and practiced and got to the store and actually the she responded in Italian, which of course I don't understand. But luckily we laughed and we realized that she said, at least you tried. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just that um that's what I'm a little concerned about. The smaller places got, you know, going. So are there any tips to like smaller, like how do you get around smaller places, not the big cities? 
Well, nowadays, I think with technology and if you get some phone data or a SIM card when you land in the country, which was a, a life changer for me, because I, I went to um, some countries before that only spoke Russian and it was really, I was really worried about being by myself there. But I got a SIM card and I used Google Translate. So I would type in what I wanted to say and then um, they would respond. So that's a really good way of breaking the, the language barrier if you're, uh, if you're worried about the language. But also in Italy, they've got an amazing train system. So if you don't feel comfortable driving, you can get around by train. And people generally in the tourism industry do speak a bit of English. But if you can speak, yeah, the base, and you can always get by with yeah, body I, caught, I caught the train from Rome to Paris and then to wow. Venice with the a, we were two of us. So it was it was interesting. There was a strike, so we we're like, what do we do? But we got to where we wanted to go. So, um, but I was with someone then, you know. So, but I'm I'm going to plan a trip because I want to go to Portugal and back to see more of Spain. And I want to go like to Dubrovnik, Montenegro, a lot of places I want to go, which my friends don't want to go. I'm like, I'm going to have to go by myself. <laughs> well done. I just got to take the plunge yeah. and do it. Yeah. I just, I said, next year I'm going to do a, I probably go to Dubrovnik and maybe Monte, that little area right there. Yeah. And not because I visit them on the cruise, but I want to go and stay a week or two. Uh, so hopefully it'll turn out okay. <laughs> I I'll let you know. If, yeah, if you plan ahead, just do as much planning as you can. Dubrovnik is beautiful. Croatia, I feel, is very solo, female friendly, generally, wherever yeah. I have been. There. I've heard that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, so fingers crossed. Yeah. Amazing we have, trip. Yeah, one last question, and then I think we probably are going to have to wrap. I can see some people are, are having to leave for work and what have you. So, how do you know if private drivers prearranged from the airport are legit? Yeah, if you if you prearranged it with your accommodation and they have your name or the name of the hotel on a little sign when you come in, then that's definitely legit. They just arrange it with your um, get them to tell you your name. You don't tell them your name mm -hmm. first. Yeah, if they don't have a sign, but they should have a sign if you've organized it and it's been prearranged. Yeah. And they will be waiting for you. And if not, whoever's arranged it for you, you should be able to contact them if there's no one there. But um, yeah, yeah. I, I have to say, I think I always feel really like this lovely sigh of relief when I arrive somewhere and there's somebody with my name on a sign. And I'm like, yes. Okay, next stop in my accommodation, I'm okay. So um, much more so than if I were to jump in a taxi. At, mm. I wouldn't do that at a... At a yeah, no. <clears throat> Always yeah, pretty much. Right. Yeah. yeah, try to avoid the people. I've been done this a few times. I've got, got caught in it. Oh. That when you, you know, when you're kind of a bit jet lagged and you come out at arrivals and then these people come up to you and taxi, 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 yeah. man, taxi. Yeah. And a couple of times I've gone with them and then I realized, hang on, no, I need to go to a proper taxi rank and make sure it's a licensed taxi. So you really need, it can be very easy to get caught off guard, I think. So at least pre-arranging something, you know exactly that you're getting into what you've, what they've sent you. Yeah. Okay, well, I think um, that's pretty much everything. So thanks, everybody. That's been great. Really, um, thank you for participating and sticking with us through all of that and listening to us go on about our favourite subject and hopefully yours, which is why you're here. So um, any questions, um, and you can contact me. You have my email because it's on the invitation that I sent out to you. Um, and also there's in the link and also in the email that I will follow up has Lisa's website address so you can get to Lisa and her website and then if you need to contact her you can do that through that um okay. so thank you very much everybody and um safe and happy travels and hope you all get to go wherever your heart takes you enjoy thank you thank you, thank thank you so much. much thank you, thank Lisa. you. Bye. thanks ladies thank you bye bye, bye. bye.